Hi, um, this week we're talking to Dr Zhang um, from the American Natural History Museum on his recent publication on the biting forces in extinct and living carnivores. So Dr Zhang, could you just explain the publication for us please? Sure, uh, the, the general theme in our publication is biological structure and function uh, because from textbooks, from every bi biology class that you take, you know that there is a very general connection between the physical characteristics of organisms uh, and the range of possible activities that they can perform. Uh, for example, when the wings are very good for flying, uh, long legs are very good for running. Uh, however, when paleontologists uh, use this logic to try to reconstruct the lifestyles of extinct animals, uh, this structure function link really is not as clear cut uh, as you might think. Uh, really, it probably is because the best preserved parts of an organism in the fossil record, at least for animals with backbones, uh, are the bones uh, without the soft, squishy parts. Uh, even though you know it's critical in living animals to have both the bones and the squishy parts and all the neural networks working together uh, to perform a given function properly. So in this study, uh, we wanted to test just how well we can try to identify the diets or feeding preferences of uh, living carnivorous mammals through the analysis of just their skull bones, so without the muscles and uh, all the other squishy parts of the animal. And the way we went about doing this is to uh, use CT scanning, computer tomography. This is an X-ray technique to capture the three-dimensional structure of skulls and other things. And we scan a series of skulls and built these uh, virtual models. Pretty much, you know, they're sort of like animations, but they're actually there's a lot of hard data involved. Uh, we have to first of all assign different material properties to the models. Uh, we have to give them estimates of approximately how much force, muscle force, is involved in biting. Uh, and, and most importantly of all, we, we need to have a broad sample to, to make our comparisons. Uh, so really what we found was that, uh, surprisingly, it, it didn't really matter so much what you ate, but actually uh, your absolute size and also your evolutionary ancestry matter more for how your, your skull functions. And, and that came as a surprise because we in evolutionary biology, we usually think that animals are, are so well adapted to environments, you know, to eat certain things that you know, it must be, you know, the engineer of the skull must be very you know, optimized to do certain tasks. Um, but our main findings from this paper are that that's not always true, at least in carnivores. Uh, in the sample of species that we looked at, you know, other factors such as size and ancestry mattered more. Uh, but still, that doesn't mean that we could not find any connection between the, the structure of the animal and the actual function it performs. Uh, it's just that we need to, first of all, remove the effects of size and, and ancestry. And what we actually found was that uh, the meat specialists, so animals like wolves and leopards, uh, had a, a certain type of a ratio between the, the efficiency at which they're producing the bite force and also the stiffness of their skull. Uh, so unlike uh, expectations from first principles of biomechanics, which is you know, the further back you go in the mouth uh, when you chew, the stronger your bite is, relatively speaking, and and hopefully the stronger your skull is. Uh, for these meat specialists like leopards and wolves, uh, you actually get uh, particular position, bite positions in the jaw that show you know, the stiffest skull. So for the leopard, which uses the front jaw to chew on these animals uh, that they hunt down, uh, the front bite positions are actually stronger, and whereas in the wolves, which uses the back teeth molars to crush bones, uh, the molars in the back are, are much stronger under these simulations. Uh, and, and compare that, contrast that to more omnivorous and generalist species, uh, which does show a pattern of stronger bites and stronger skulls going further back in the mouth, uh, as you would expect from first principles. Uh, so that's pretty much so the, the gist of you know, our, our main question and all the finding. Oh, so you mentioned um, in the paper about how you use the CT scans. I'm just wondering, is this a relatively new area of science then, or were other methods employed before we could use CT scans and um, sort of animations um, to recreate this data? That's a great question, because CT scan has been around for quite a few years, uh, even though the, the earlier and most common applications are in the biomedical fields and also in, in other fields such as engineering. Uh, the application of CT imaging to biology and, and specifically to, to this type of study, studying the function of animals, is relatively new, uh, partly because you know, biologists have not been thinking 
in such a purely industrial and engineering perspective you know, before, really up until you know, 10 years ago, not a lot of people use this technique to try to figure out how animals work. Uh, but when, if you really think about it, you know, the way that animals work, they, they're equipped uh, from natural selection, they're equipped with a, a wide variety of tool sets for them to use, uh, just like tools that we use in our daily lives. So really, the way to understand them, for me at least, is to you know, approach from an engineering perspective. Uh, and, and in that sense, the method that I use, uh, finite element analysis, that's the simulation technique, is actually originally an engineering technique. Now, engineers still use it to, to test you know, bridge design, to test car designs, even to test you know, how spacecrafts might break up or, or resist stress you know, uh, when they're shot into the sky. Uh, so really, it's just an extension of that technique into biology and, and in our case, extend it into paleontology to try to better understand the lifestyles of extinct animals. So this project is very good sort of branching of engineering and biology together and using fossils as well. Um, on the subject of fossils and things, um, we were wondering, are you going to branch out into other species um, and sort of maybe primates or something, or are you staying on the carnivores? All right, so for this particular publication, we focused on a, a small illustrative uh, data set of just a handful of species, uh, but our, our next study is really going to apply this method. So this publication is really about you know, showing the method and see how it can be applied to the fossil record. But right now, currently, we're working on a much more expanded data set uh, within carnivorous mammals. Um, but the method itself really can be applied to, you know, for example, like you said, in primates, uh, which also has a very interesting evolutionary history uh, in terms of the adaptations. Uh, not the least because a part of that lineage led to honoring humans. So there's already a lot of interest in studying you know, early hominids, for example, fossil hominids and, and how their skulls worked. Uh, but I, I don't think there are any studies in hominids that have you know, looked at these various factors the way that we did in this paper. So I think it would be very exciting to try to apply this to other groups and just see. And, and that's part of the hope for this paper is to you know, put the method out there and hope that other researchers should pick it up and, and apply to their groups of expertise and see if you know, we can find more general trends. That's brilliant. Um, um, sorry. Um, yeah, I think that's about everything, actually. You've covered it brilliantly. <laughs> Thank um, you. Is there anything else you want to add? Uh, sure. Uh, I think that uh, this is not the only method. Something else that uh, we've worked on and recently published actually is a companion, sort of companion study to this one is that whereas in this study we are really looking at trying to establish the link between the structure of animals and their biting function. Uh, our companion paper actually looks at uh, over evolutionary time uh, whether you can predict or actually you can interpret uh, some product of evolution as being optimized. Uh, so really the, the main question in, the, in our other paper is in terms of optimization, uh, whether some of these features that you see you know, work so well in modern animals, you know, wolves being very good meat eaters, whereas you know, raccoons, for example, are very good at eating a variety of things, uh, whether in those you know, particular niches, those animals are, are optimized, you know, given what they have to do. Uh, and what we found out is you know, also interesting that you know, in most cases, no, animals are, are far from optimized, uh, and it's probably just because there's a combination, as we found in this study, of the effect of their absolute size, uh, the effect of their ancestry. Uh, a raccoon may have, may have inherited you know, raccoon-like features from its great, great ancestor raccoon. So it's it's limited in terms of what it can do. It can't really branch out. It can do certain things well, but not you know, branch out into other areas of um, adaptation. So I think. Uh, those are also important to, to look into. It's not just what kind of ad adaptations we observe existing animals do, but, but in thinking about you know, what, from an a engineering perspective, what is the, the possible range of uh, structures that you might expect? And when you compare the possible range to the actual result of evolution, sometimes you realize that many things have not evolved uh, although they might be more optimal than what we see in existing animals. So that's something interesting I think we're also pursuing. And again, we hope to bring that method out to, into other groups for you know, other researchers to apply 
and to see if I can find more you know, general trends about you know, how animals evolve. So this companion um, study, is that being worked on at the moment? Um, is it going to be published in the next couple of months? Or? Uh, that companion paper actually was published uh, two weeks after this paper we're talking about here uh, in a in separate publication. But I can definitely forward you a copy. It's oh, Yeah, we'll link you to that one as well underneath. <laughs> Sure, great, yeah, yeah, and it's just another methods paper. That one's a little bit harder to read, even for me, <laughs> after writing, I was like, why did I just write? But it's probably because it's a more technical treatment of sort of the, the optimality problem. This is brilliant, and um, thank you very much for talking to us. And um, like we said, we'll link both papers underneath, and we'll also put a link to your Twitter. Um, great, you that, yeah, thank you very much for having me. It's great no talking problem. to you. Bye. Okay, bye.